Landis, Julie Gentry, and Emma Lawrence. Thanks, Kayla. Um, so our project, um, thank you all for coming to um, our presentation on establishing distributed wind in Virginia. Um, I'm Emma Lawrence, again, um, and my partners are Julie Gentry, Nick Cooper, and Patrick Landis. Um, we're just going to begin the presentation um, with a quick overview. Um, so we're going to go over the background and purpose of this project, as well as the definition and examples of distributed wind, um, the policy and applicable incentives, the four case studies that we focused on during our two years, and then conclusions. So the main motivation for this project came from the 2014 Virginia Energy Plan that was established by the Department of Mines, Minerals, and Energy. That um, project set a goal of achieving 25% renewable energy in Virginia by the year 2025. Um, wind is a really good resource to um, help reach this goal because according to DMME, there is a potential capacity for of wind generation of 1,800 megawatts. Um, for comparison, that's enough to power about 1 million homes. This project was um, proceeded, or before this project, there was the Distributed Wind Assistance Program that was completed by Kayla Cook and Sydney Sumner. And through their project, they worked to identify and rank um, individuals throughout the state as far as their wind resource and viability. So we're going to continue with four of those participants that they identified. So before we go into the technicalities of the report, I'd like to give a brief overview of what exactly Distributed Wind is. The Department of Energy defines uh, distributed wind through two aspects, proximity and use, that is turbines installed at or near the point of end use of the user, and the point of interconnection, which is basically referring to the turbine being installed on the customer side of the meter. Um, one or multiple turbines can be deployed with various applications, such as remote off-grid applications, um, up to several multi-megawatt turbines for large energy users, such as universities. Due to the main nature of distributed wind systems, Installations are often people live and work, usually making distributed wind turbines the public's first exposure to wind energy, and thus an important aspect in education and outreach. Um, this may help towards shifting public opinion to reliance on wind and renewable energy resources. Uh, this slide just shows the various sizes that wind turbines can come in, with the smaller turbines on the left and the larger turbines on the right. Uh, the U.S. distributed wind capacity and potential is displayed on the image on the Right, with 934 megawatts of cumulative distributed wind capacity installed between 2003 and 2015 with the orange line. Um, the light blue section shows uh, distributed wind turbines larger than one uh, kilowatt with the yellow section showing medium-sized turbines and lastly the navy blue section showing distributed wind turbines less than 100 kilowatts. Um, a feasibility study conducted by the Department of Energy found, found that up to 44% of U.S. buildings are technically feasible for distributed wind systems this, along with remote applications, speaks to the sheer potential for distributed wind in the U.S. There are multiple funding mechanisms available for distributed wind projects today. The main incentive that our project focused on is the Rural Energy for America program offered by the United States Department of Agriculture. This gives small business owners in rural areas of up to 50,000 people or less, or agricultural producers around America, access to grants of up to 25%, or low interest uh, guaranteed loans of up to 75% for renewable energy or energy efficiency projects. At the state level, the Department of Mine, Minerals, and Energy offers a low interest community loan program called Virginia Saves to meet this 2014 Virginia Energy Plan. Um, and in the private sector, the main funding mechanism comes in the form of a third party investing in the capital costs of the project and either selling the energy uh, in the form of a power purchase agreement or leasing the turbine over a certain amount of time to the end user or at the end of that leasing agreement, the, the end user then owns the turbine. So the main um, modeling software that was used throughout this whole project was um, the System Advisory Model, or SAM. Um, this is provided by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, um, and it is a performance and financially model software for renewable energy systems. So um, we focused on wind turbine um, energy outputs based off of um, local resource data. However, um, you can also use the software for um, solar outputs, geothermal, um, and as well as other types of renewable energy. This is just a brief overview of the four sites, um, highlighting the uniqueness at each location. Um, Fancy Gap Elementary School is an elementary school in southwestern Virginia, um, and their main goal is to upgrade their current energy system and reduce their energy bills. Um, Bradford Fay Farms is an aquaculture center along the eastern shore, um, and their main goal is sustainability. 
Prince William County Landfill is an eco park in Northern Virginia and their main goal is to provide educational resources to the surrounding area. And Chesapeake Bay Foundation is a nonprofit in Chesapeake, Virginia um, and their main goal is to increase sustainability. This is just um, a map showing the location of the four sites that we um, focused on during our two years. Um, the dark green is wind speeds from ranging from 5.1 to 6 meters or above. Um, and based off of the coloring, um, all of the locations that we focused on had uh, good to fair wind speeds. I was the main site contact for Bradford Bay Farms, which is an aquaculture center um, in Quinby, Virginia. Um, this aquaculture center started um, with the Dr. Clark Morton's vision um, to create sustainable and chemical free fish. Um, and now they have um, switched to um, some ornamental fish farming as well. Um, their population is 282 individuals, um, so it is definitely a rural part of Virginia. Um, and the main funding source that we looked at at this site um, was REAP. Um, the stakeholders involved in this process were the business owners themselves as well as the co-op. Um, and then this um, graphic to the right um, is something that we submitted to DMME in order to hopefully secure more funding um, in the future as well as currently for this project. Um, each of the four sites have this graphic on their intro slide. Um, with a close-up of the image, um, the image in respect to the whole state of Virginia, a close-up of the county, and a wind rose, which shows wind frequency and direction um, of wind in that location. All of the sides will also have this graphic presented um, by the Center for Wind Energy. Um, the annual average wind speeds that this site was concerned with was the 20 to 34 <laughs> meter range. Um, while um, a higher hub height would produce um, higher amounts of uh, wind electricity, um, there were some transmission issues um, and upgrades that were financially constricting, um, as well as the Bradford Bay Farms wanted to keep um, their total turbine costs under $200,000 um, in order to ease the application project process through REAP. So this is a graph of their monthly energy use um, for the past year. Um, their average monthly energy use um, is about 2,300 kilowatts, um, with their bill being about $2,200. Um, and their annual bill for this past year was $26,000. Um, their bill is divided into four different sectors. The fish hatchery, which consumes the greatest amount of power at that site. Um, the yellow house in the orange line. Um, this peak um, was during a time frame that the, um, the business was housing their staff members on site. So that is why there's a peak and then a s steep drop off. Um, the irrigation pumps are in yellow, and the mobile house is in gray. So um, this site is a great place for renewable energy because they do have a really great re wind resource um, as well as a consistently high energy load. Their fish hatchery consumes about 93% of their total energy load. Um, and then this graph is just showing um, their load factor. So it's the energy consumed by the fish hatchery divided by the total energy use, um, which is consistent um, throughout all months out of the year. The turbine options that I focused on um, were, and with the help of the SAM model, um, were the EO cycle, the Gaia wind, and the future energy turbines. Um, they have relatively low um, ratings, and these were chosen because the system and installation costs are all under $200,000, um, and also work with the um, phase one connection, which is the main restriction at this site. Um, the energy produced over the system lifetime is based off of a, an assumption that there's 25 the average of 25 um, years of turbine life. The payback period um, is a simple payback period, so it was just the system cost divided by the savings um, by the turbine. Um, and the payback period with REAP was an optimistic assumption that the site would be able to secure a 25% grant. And then these two graphs um, show the total energy, the total energy use um, is in the top blue line, and then um, the gray is the EO cycle turbine, the blue is the future energy turbine, and the orange is the Gaia wind turbine. Um, and that just shows um, how the, ener the energy produced by each turbine and how that would reduce their total load over time. Um, and then this graph displays um, the bill adjustment with um, the help of the turbine installed at the site. So although the EO cycle um, would reduce the bill the most because it is a more expensive turbine, um, the payback period is far greater than the Gaia wind. Um, so my recommendations of this site are to um, complete a more comprehensive analysis 
Um, there were some technical issues with the SAM model, and I was unable to complete um, a payback period analysis, including all financial incentives. So tax credits would um, lower the payback period for all turbines, um, as well as including contractor bids um, for the actual installation. SAM uses an average for the region, so having an actual contractor bid would have a more precise um, payback period. Um, as well as an in-depth site evaluation to determine any possible installation issues. It is a remote area, so um, there might be issues in um, actually like getting people to come out there, um, as well as um, if there's any fault lines in the area and actual um, foundation issues um, with a turbine on the site. So I was the main site contact for Fancy Gap Elementary School, which is located in the southwestern part of the state right along the North Carolina border. Um, Fancy Gap Elementary School is located in Carroll County, Virginia. Carroll County has a population of almost 30,000 people, but it is still a very rural location. Um, some of the primary stakeholders in this project were the um, Carroll County Public Schools superintendent, and who was the initial applicant to the DWAP program, Carroll County residents, and the students at Fancy Gap Elementary School. Um, this map is the wind resource that was created, or the map of the wind resource that was created by the Center for Wind Energy. So highlighted is the 50 meter wind speed, and that's the um, wind speed we're going to focus on because that is the hub height of the turbine that I analyzed. And the wind speed here is 5.61 meters per second on average. So the energy usage at Fancy Gap um, is a little bit different than the other energy usages because they actually have two energy sources. Their main um, source of energy is electricity provided by Appalachian Power Company. Um, so they have an average monthly metered usage of just over 30,000 kilowatt hours with a annual or an average peak energy usage of um, 142 kilowatts. That makes an, approxi an approximate annual electricity cost of just over $38,000 for the electricity provided by APCO. Um, their second source of energy is a coal burning boiler system in the basement of the school. That system is um, really old and needs to be replaced, so that will lead to um, a further analysis later on in the presentation. But they use approximately 59 tons of coal per year, costing them just over $8,000, which brings the total energy cost per year to um, just over $46,000 annually. So the first analysis I did was on the Northern Power Systems North Wind 100 kilowatt turbine. Um, I did this analysis using the um, SAM model that was previously outlined. Using that model, I was able to estimate the monthly energy production, assuming that the annual wind speed is 5.61 meters per second. Um, so this estimate was a really rough estimate, but I did use that analysis to um, adjust the monthly usage, the monthly electricity usage and the monthly electricity cost at the school with an electricity rate of 11.4 cents per kilowatt hour. So this is a graph of the energy usages before and after turbine installation. The top uh, blue line is before the installation and the bottom line is after installation. You can see a significant decrease in um, the metered energy usage per month. Um, so using the initial cost of the turbine that was produced by the SAM model of $576,000, I was able to calculate the simple payback period of about 26 years, assuming annual savings of almost $22,000. Second analysis I did was of a ground coupled geothermal heat pump, which would replace the boiler system that they currently have in place. Um, so the first step in doing that analysis was to calculate the heating load of Fancy Gap, and I um, calculated that to be 141,000 BTUs per hour. Next was to calculate or to estimate the annual operating hours of the system. So I went ahead and assumed that they would use the system to provide heating eight days or eight hours a day for five months out of the year. Um, using that information, I calculated an annual or total annual cost of electricity to run this system to be nine hundred and sixty-one dollars per year. So the annual savings by replacing the um, boiler with a geothermal heat pump would be just over $7,000 and I calculated that they would need a 12, uh, system with a 12 ton capacity which would cost them um, $70,800 producing a simple payback period of about 10 years for the geothermal heat pump. My recommendations for this site 
because of the lack of wind data that they currently have would to be it would be to install a, a meteorological tower for monitoring of the um, winds there before going and pursuing a turbine installation just so that they would have a better idea and a more um, thorough analysis of the system including um, all the tax incentives and um, federal funding that they could possibly be um, able to receive. Um, the, for the ground coupled geothermal heat pump, I would say go ahead and install that because they already need to replace the system that they have and this um, system has a pretty low payback period. In addition to the low payback period, um, a further economic analysis could be done including the tax incentives and um, federal incentives. So my site was the Princeton County Landfill, located in the upper part of the image or the northern part of Virginia. Um, it's located in Manassas, Virginia, um, and had the, Princeton County has a site population of just over 438,000, making this uh, county and site location much more densely populated than the other site, um, sites. So, um, the stakeholders concerned with site are the site operators, the local community and schools, including the school board and superintendent, um, as well as the local utilities involved, such as Novak and potentially Dominion. The site is unique in that the, the proposed turbine location is on top of a cap section of the landfill. So just as before, these are some of the wind resources for my site. Uh, the main range we're focused at is the wind resource, uh, wind speeds associated with the 20 to 34 meter hub height, with the uh, average wind speed at 30 meters being about 3.69 meters per second. Um, obviously the wind resources aren't as plentiful at this site, however, the site has a high potential for education and outreach. Um, as you can see, there is 16 schools of various age groups within a 15 minute drive. Um, I took this image from Google Maps. Um, there's also been multiple involvements with uh, eco plans, um, multiple involvement with universities for eco plans such as Virginia Tech and George Mason. Um, these are some of the current eco park concepts on the image on the left with trail creations to the new Colgan High School. Um, they just finished a wetlands creation project with George Mason. Um, they have landfill to gas energy facility which converts collected methane from the landfill to electricity. They also have a waste conversion site. Um, the image on the right uh, shows an eco building area that has um, architectural designs with involvement with Virginia Tech. Um, they have plans for a solar installation area on a naturally south facing slope. Um, and of course the turbine installation area proposed on top of the cap section of the landfill. Um, as far as outreach goes, the turbine location has great visibility from Virginia 234, which is an interconnect between I-66 and I-95 in the northern part of Virginia. Um, these are various turbine options that could be applied. They're all pretty small. The X-Series 442SR is the largest power rating with a 12.2 kilowatt power rating. Uh, the rest of the turbines are all under 10 kilowatts. Um, a potential plan would be to uh, deploy an array of turbines on top of the installation area with various hub pipes to compare performance differences um, under varying wind speeds. Um, originally, um, this site was only planned to be used as an educational platform. However, it was recently discovered that the site uses condensate pumps as a means of leachate management. Um, and the pumps are a potential application for energy produced by the, by a, a Bergy Excel turbine. The Bergy Excel turbine was chosen because it was the only available turbine to be run in a simulation under SAM. Um, it was found that for two pumps, there's a monthly service fee of $51 or $25.50 uh, for each pump. And this service fee is kind of a make or break, making the Bergy economical as opposed to just an educational tool. Um, if this uh, could be negated, the annual savings would be $687 with a payback period of 10 years. Um, obviously, this would require some net metering negotiations with Novec to negate this service fee. Um, and as far as off-grid applications go to negate the service fee, battery and other balance of system costs would need to be applied in a more in-depth analysis. So some recommendations moving forward is that the location and the current eco plans make the site a great tool for education and outreach. Um, on top of the potential benefits um, as an education uh, platform, the Bergy Excel One Turbine may act as a renewable source for energy on small loads for on-site. The Center for Wind Energy also has plans to put up a meteorological tower this summer to acquire more reliable wind data. So I was the site lead for Chesapeake Bay Foundation, located at Port Isabel, uh, just east of Tangier Island in the Chesapeake Bay. <clears throat> uh, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation uh, is, uh, has many locations around uh, the area but in specifically we're looking at Port Isabel here. 
Um, the, it's located in Accomack County, Virginia, with population of 727 as of 2010. Uh, the main stakeholders in this project or for this site would be the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, uh, the town of Tangier, which has the opportunity to import a lot of this uh, potential energy production uh, from a wind turbine, and the electric co-op that services the county, a and um, The initial wind resource analysis conducted uh, <coughs> produced by the, Center, or by the Center for Wind Energy uh, shows that there's very uh, a very good wind resource uh, at 50 meters. The average annual wind speed was 6.9 meters per second, uh, and that's the that's the height that we're concerned about for turbine analysis. Um, there's been a meteorological tower that was commissioned in September of 2009. Um, this tower has multiple sensors at various heights and at the same height uh, for wind resource verification. Some of these sensors include a wind vane for uh, wind direction and anemometers uh, for wind speed. The data is logged as 10 minute averages. Um, unfortunately, due to complexities with the energy load data, uh, with hundreds of residential and commercial end users on Tangier, as well as Port Isabel, uh, I was unable to con collect and analyze the energy data, so I conducted a more extensive wind resource analysis. The first analysis conducted was a frequency distribution. Um, I isolated the 50 meter wind speed for, uh, for a collection period of four and a half years. Um, I stopped at March 14 because of uh, logging errors in the data. Um, I created both a normal distribution using the data as well as a Weibull distribution, which is a further statistical analysis that more accurately represents the variability in the wind data. Um, one thing that I find important that, of note is that 56% of the data logged occurred between uh, the wind speeds of four meters per second and 10 meters per second. Which has a very, uh, which has the potential to impact the energy output. Um, I looked at three different turbines uh, for my energy output analysis: the Endurance E3120, which is rated at 50 kilowatts; the Endurance E4660, rated at 85 kilowatts; and the Northwind uh, Northern Power Systems Northwind 100 kilowatt turbine. Um, as you can see, the Endurance E4660 uh, had the highest average annual output at 266 megawatt hours. Now this is surprising because it has a lower rated output um, than the North Northwind 100 kilowatt, but the reason that it has a higher average annual output potential um, is due to the, the fact that the, there was 56% of the of the, fit, the frequency of 56% of the wind speed being found between four and 10 meters per second. And as you can see on this power curve comparison chart, um, the Endurance E4660 has a higher rated output uh, than the Northwind from four to 10 meters per second. Uh, as part of my honors project, I conducted, as part of my honors requirement, I conducted an extra feasibility study into turbine implementation on Tangier. Some of the things I looked at were uh, for challenges facing turbine deployment were uh, sea level rise and land area loss due to erosion and sea level rise, uh, socioeconomic challenges as well as logistical challenges with, act with actually uh, transporting the equipment and constructing the turbine on the island. Uh, the first analysis I conducted I uh, used uh, Google Earth Engine, which is an open source GIS platform. Uh, I used maps of Tangier from 1984 to 2014 to calculate the average decadal uh, land area loss of around 10%. Uh, this is very concerning for the people of Tangier, but in terms of a project lifetime of 20 to 30 years for a wind turbine, this is not necessarily the most uh, or the largest concern. Um, looking here at the historical census data of population for the town of Tangier. Um, they topped off around 1,200 in 1930 um, and have historically, they've historically been declining. Uh, that's due to two, two reasons. Uh, one, as seen before, they, there's a lot of land area loss. They're losing uh, places to put homes. And uh, another main part of this population decline is due to their economic hardships. Tangier is largely, or is entirely a fishing, uh, focused on the fishing industry crabbing and oystering in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, this is largely concentrated by middle-aged males, uh, and so there's really minimal opportunity for women and youth uh, in terms of economic prosperity on the island. So many people have been leaving uh, in terms because of losing their, home, their land, as well as uh, trying to find work in the mainland. Um, logistical challenges with actually getting the equipment there and putting the turbine up in the construction. Um, as you can see in this harbor chart from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, 
Uh, this blue area represents very shallow waters. Um, waters can be as, at, you might not be able to see the numbers, but there's parts of, around Tangier, uh, because it's in a channel, uh, that are as low as two feet, or as shallow as two feet. Uh, this largely limits the amount of bo uh, vessels that can get there by, by sea. Um, so one, uh, one opportunity to get the equipment there would be using a shallow uh, draft vessel or a, a barge. Um, there is, all, there is also, due to the sandy nature of the island and a high water table, there would be a, have to be an extensive uh, foundation certification conducted in order to uh, figure out the best type of foundation needed to uh, combat the sandy soil and the high water table. Um, also, in order to export a, a large amount of the power from Port Isabel uh, across the channel to Tangier Island, to the town, um, there would be, need to be a transmission uh, upgrade. Um, Continued stakeholder communication is, is recommended for this project, this site. Um, in, the tor in, in, in general, uh, with Chesapeake Bay Foundation as well as the people of Tangier, um, in order to further develop this project and understand uh, the energy demand, we would need to collect all of these residential and commercial energy loads and analyze that. Uh, and also, more extensive on-site analysis, like I said, into the uh, foundation and, and, and et cetera. Uh, would be required to begin the permitting process for this site. So for a project summary, throughout the past year we have visited each of the sites and facilitated stakeholder engagement as well as performed various analyses on turbines for each of the sites. Some recommendations moving forward with the project would be stay involved with all the stakeholders for each of the sites and maintain adequate communication with each of the DWAP applicants. Acquiring more reliable wind data as well as load data for each of the sites may also uh, enable a more in-depth site analysis. Some of the challenges that we faced um, throughout our time working on this project were inconsistency in communication um, and that led to the inability to complete some of the energy um, analyses that we wanted to complete um, and that coupled with the limited time frame um, prohibited these um, more in-depth analyses. Um, as for moving forward, um, while there's no long, there's not going to be a capstone team to take over this project, um, the Center for Wind Energy um, and JMU have received a $91,000 grant from the U.S. Um, Department of Energy, um, the Rural Energy Development and Assistance Grant. Um, this was matched with $50,000 cash from the DMME, um, and this will be able um, enable the Center for Wind Energy to employ a full-time staff member into um, the progress of these these four projects as well as expand the work that we've been doing to other um, locations identified by the original um, DWAP project. So we would like to thank Dr. Jonathan Miles for advising us on this project, Phil Sturm and Remy Pangle of the Center for Wind Energy, Dr. Tony Chen, Mr. Paul Hendrickson, and all of the DWAP applicants. At this point in time, which site do you think is the most attractive? The most attractive or the most like plausible? I guess the most the most feasible at this point. This point probably mix. Um, I maybe mine, but not on a large scale for energy producing yeah. uh, purposes. Definitely like this, some of the turbines that I showed in this slide were like really cheap, like thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and they're really low power ratings. So the potential to get one up there is a lot more easy. They're Thank also you. driven for like from like the educational aspect so I'm pretty sure that they're gonna like end up putting a wind turbine yeah. on there no matter what um, otherwise I think Bradford Bay um, is a very also very good candidate um, as long as they secure um, REIT funding thank you did you have a question Corey oh yeah um, I was just wondering this is for Patrick if you uh, if you thought the uh, recent change in administration and recent uh, Defunding of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation is yeah. going to affect the progress that you know we're trying to make and the well-being. Right. Um. Obviously, hope for the best. Uh, there's a lot of, as I mentioned before, there's a lot of you know private third-party funding that we can still secure. Um, and as long as, as, if we, if I can, for that site specifically, if we can uh, conduct like an energy load analysis to match the demand with an energy produced from a turbine and create a, a, a you know a payback period, if it's if it's an attractive payback period, that will attract out, out external funding. So it's potential to have the project move forward. Mm -hmm. 
regardless. Hopefully. Hopefully. Anyone else? Sure. <laughs> Does Tangier Island have any renewable energy right now? Um, they have solar panels uh, as part of a previous project. Uh, they got a grant, I believe, from the Department of Agriculture. Uh, I, I'm not sure if it was re a previous REAP, but anyways, yeah, they had they got funding to put solar panels up, um, and that helped. Yeah. In fact, that funding was uh, during the period of the American Recovery and Reinvestment mm -hmm. Act. Yeah. It was error funding, and right. as Patrick knows, one of the challenges that funding was intended to install wind, but yep. you might want to talk about one of the challenges you right. there. Right. Um, so Tangier's main, uh, a lot of the way they get uh, their good, their goods and stuff is because they have an airstrip. Um, there is a very isolated community. It's very hard to get anything out there. There's a mail boat that goes once a day every year, but the main way that they get a, a lot of their goods is through their airstrip. And that's, that's uh, so the previous project had intended to put a turbine near the airstrip. Uh, but due to the state, the state aviation office, uh, I, I believe there was some pushback from the state aviation office in uh, potentially like future funding for Tangier on their airstrip. So uh, that project sort of became a solar project instead. Cool. Yeah. So you all might recall we we've talked about over the year that to an extent this distributed wind effort is meant to maybe learn from and follow Iowa's efforts of a decade or more ago, where Iowa is a state similar in size, similar in a lot of other ways, uh, and has had great success with that. Yes. But it's taken Virginia longer to get off the ground. Yes. And, I, okay, so I didn't set you up with this question, so I'm going to put you on the <laughs> hot, hot seat a little bit. Uh, from everything you all have learned at these four sites, is there maybe one commonality you see that presents challenge, kind of a common theme that makes Virginia a more challenging state to develop distributed wind in? Or are the projects just too <coughs> bare? Say there's one thing you could point your finger at. Um, I, I don't, I wouldn't say commonly because each of our sites are very like different on multiple levels, but uh, I'd say working with utilities um, in Virginia might be a challenge uh, just because the nature of the utilities in Virginia as opposed to the nature of utilities um, in Iowa. You could also m maybe mention um, how early Iowa began their renewable portfolio standard and their statewide program to develop renewable energies. Um, that, that, that goes down to the, like an ethics basis. Uh, they just simply knew that renewable energy was viable in, in Iowa. They have really great wind resources all over the state. Um, and because these projects are economically, you know, they they work so so uh, there was a state there was policy put in place uh, a couple of decades ago to begin the renewable energy development in Iowa and other states around uh, mm -hmm. the United States. Emma, Julie, anything else you'd add to that? I think that um, funding is also a really big issue, um, especially when we're looking at like more rural areas. Um, maybe not Nick's site specifically, but. Um, funding, even on the time frame that we were looking at this, has been going away. Um, and as Corey pointed out, some um, potential issues with the future administration. Um, right now, wind energy just really isn't a priority, in my opinion, um, based off of the funding that's available from um, the state. So, um, in order, I think, in order to like advance further, there would need to be some type of state, like established state program, um, in order to find, provide funds to those who want to and can implement distributed wind, but just don't have the funds to. I mean, I agree with Emma. The capital cost of wind is pretty high, so the funding is always an issue. That's How did you like choose these four sites? So the project last year had like a really, in, they came up with their own type of ranking system based off of wind resource um, and project viability, so like, um, potential education outreach um, and like physical location of where the turbine would be placed um, and that's how so the group last year identified these four sites um, and we just picked up picked up those four sites and tried to push them like closer towards the um, like development stage okay. Yeah, they set up a huge uh, they were able to get a lot of like distributed wind fact sheets and then also like about the distributed wind assistance program just like uh, information out to these you know, different farms and small businesses around Virginia. And so they sent these out to thousands of, 
these, these sites. Mm -hmm. um, and then they got a bunch of the applications back and ranked them all based on their viability of a project of, of multiple different me major, major metrics. Yeah. Major. All right, well, um, thank you. <laughs>